I want to interview interesting people. And uh, my plan is, uh, especially some elderly preachers that I know, I want to get them on, let them give their testimony, because it's a fact that that'll be around a long time after they're gone and I'm gone. And uh, I think there's a lot of things, a lot of wisdom that people can share, older folks especially, that will help us and help generations to come. And so I feel like that that is a very needed thing in this hour. Don't you wish you could go back to when you were young, you'd pay more attention to older folks when they spoke and when they said something. And uh, that would greatly advantage all of us if we did more of that, I'm sure. So that's our purpose, and uh, I like interesting people. I like strange people. I really do. I love (laughs) y'all. And, of course, the one we're going to interview tonight is not strange. She is interesting, and uh, we appreciate her. And uh, She's been a part of our church for a long time, and so we'll get into it. And uh, Miss Barbara Hackworth. And, of course, you'll notice by her accent that uh, she was not born in this country. She was born in England. And tell us when you were born and... uh, how long you've been here? How long I've been here? <laughs> I, was, I was born September the 17th, 1935. And um, I've been in this country now um, about 69 years. 69 years. Mm-hmm. And tell us about your husband, Jim. How did you meet? How did I meet him? Well, he walked through the... Um, double doors of the uh, post exchange where I was standing behind a, um, a cash register. He was tall, he was, blue, he was blonde, he was blue-eyed, and he looked straight at me and we both fell instantly in love. <laughs> and um, he had been, it was an unusual situation because he was stationed in Germany, he had done this period of duty over there, but they needed a group of men to come to Molesworth, England, and um, spend another year. And so there were five of these fellows, my husband being one of them, that came. And they were, that particular day, it was in December of um, um, 1953, Uh, they'd come to view uh, what the girls looked like in the post-exchange. That's what your boys do, mothers, when they're they're away from you. (laughs) And so anyway, um, he came straight to my cash register, and after they all left, I said to the other girls, well, I bet I date him first. (laughs) He dated me, and that was the last time he dated anyone else. (laughs) That's good. They've been a part of our church for 20 years, at least. Yes, 1992. 92, 1992, so 20 years. Uh, 30, is that 30 years? Then? Oh, <laughs> more time gets away, doesn't it? 30 years they've been members of our church, and her husband, Jim, of course, was a lifetime military man and uh, served our country, and we're very grateful for his service in the military And, of course, Jim has since passed away. But uh, we just appreciate them so much. And Barbara's been a big help to us here in the church. Now, recently, she said some things. We've been experiencing the war in Ukraine and how the cities there are being bombed. And I don't think there's any way that we can understand how tragic that is and how life-changing that would be if we lived in a country like Ukraine today. But Barbara has experienced that. And Barbara, tell us, what are your first memories uh, when you were a little girl and they were of the war and sort of what that was like in England? Well, well, I've I've, I've, uh, shared this with people before. My first memory, of course, was my mother coming to the bedroom on that dark night and my, I was afraid and my sister was about nine and she was telling me to go back to sleep and, and I kept calling for my mum and um, she opened the door and she said, Bobby, hush, go to sleep, there's a war on. And so for me in 1939, September, I was four years old, that was the beginning of a period of time where 
we were woken often in the night. My mother would have the, the, we lived in an upstairs apartment, but upstairs apartments also had a little upper area where the bedrooms were. And, lay, and on the stair rail going down those stairs were the clothes that we were to wear when mother called us. And my sister's job was to make sure that I was dressed while she went to the um, bedroom and got my, my brother, who would have been about three, and she would meet us by the front door, and we'd walk down that street with the sirens blaring and the bombs already beginning to drop to this flat-roofed building that had been built on the end of the cul-de-sac where we lived to go into a little cubicle that was a concrete floor and my mother would put a pallet on the floor and we would lay down there and mother would stand at the door because there was a wall in front of the doors. And mother would stand there and the bombs would drop that horrible acrid smell of the incendiary bombs fill in the air and my mom would sing. And the, the more the bombs dropped, the louder Mother would sing because she hoped that would keep us from, from hearing it. And for me, the smell of damp concrete puts me back to those dark nights. I don't like basements because yeah. that puts me back to that, that time, that era in my life when we were listening to the bombs drop. And mother and the air raid side siren and the air raid warden would come by and he always knew mother was there and I always remember this. Isn't it strange, just a little girl? But yeah, I remembered him saying, Mrs. B, they got the bakery tonight mm. and they'd bombed the bakery, which was just, you know, streets away from us. We didn't go I we went to school when I was three. I was considered a bright enough child that I could be brought into the school, and um, and I can I can remember, you know, my sister coming home from school, and I'd have a dirty little piece of knitting in my hand because mother had been teaching me how to knit, and I was so proud that I had this. And but if we, after we came home from school, if the siren blew between then and in the morning. If the, if the all clear didn't go off, we would um, not go to school that day. And many years later, I was in a, an apartment in New York City with my, ch my babies. My husband was in the service and a siren went off. I was running the sweeper. I heard people running I grabbed up my babies and headed for the street and I was running down the street and another English girl that knew me came out in the street and she said, Barbara, Barbara, it's all right, it's all right, it isn't an air raid, Be but it was a fire alarm. Oh, goodness. But see, I thought it was, yeah. and my sole concern was to get my babies yeah. away from whatever that yeah. was. Yeah. So the very first memories that you have as a child were the air raids and the bunkers that you yes. went to. And y'all lived in London. Uh, yes, we lived in the suburbs. Yeah. <laughs> and later, did the people that was in London, did they move out into the countryside as the war progressed? Because London was really the target yes. of the German army. Wasn't yes. It? And you see the Blitz, it was right before the Blitz, the government asked people that could, my father was already in the military, asked people that could to move their families out of the city into the countryside. And my father, I, I was thinking about that. You know, I don't remember them packing our furniture and things like that, but I know our furniture went in storage. But I do remember mother getting us early one morning with this great big brown suitcase. My, mother, my father was there taking us to the railway station where there were many, many other people and we were loaded on trains 
and we were taken out into the country. And the first place that we stayed was just a very brief period, was in, in Wildon in Bedfordshire. And we lived in a house with a, a, a lady that had a wooden leg. <laughs> And I always remember, always remember. remember that, that yeah. she had. A, and then my father moved us from there to Eaton Soken, which was on the River Ouse. Um, and we lived in one room that was about the size, of, not even as big as the master bedroom in my home. Um, we lived in a, a one room, my mother, my brother, my sister and myself, and one double bed, <laughs> little tiny fireplace, a washstand, a round table. Mother kept the groceries on the washstand. That's where we lived for six years. Six years. Homes to me are not important. I'm sorry, people. <laughs> they are not important. Um, they're a roof over my head. They're a place I have to clean up, but yeah. they're not important. <laughs> yeah. and, the most important thing is family. Is and family. Safety. And that was mother's one goal. She, she worked, my mother had to work in the fields because you see, she, any woman that was body able had to do war effort jobs. This was in the munitions factories and things such as that. And people that didn't move out and keep their families with them and get into something like that. The government would then direct where you had to work. And of course, this was, um, my mother chose to work on the farm and um, she pitched hay and, and, and not the way you all do it with machines today. This was with pick forks and, and, um, and stoked wheat and that type of thing. She picked potatoes and then she would come home in the evening to that one room and she'd get her fishing gear and she'd go over onto the um, River Ouse and we would have to sit there while she fished and relieved herself of the day's stresses. Because you see, the bombs did not stop just because we left London. London. And there was a, a fire station on the, and, and a power station on the River Ouse that the um, Germans would uh, strafe nightly and the air raid wardens would be posted on the top of that and the searchlights were just swinging across the, night, the sky all night long, crisscrossing, you know, looking for the bombs. We, were, we would go, if we had a flashlight, we could use it, but we had to hold it down because, you see, if you turned it up, then the Germans knew there was a people living down there and they would drop their bombs. And when we were children, we would be playing in, the, uh, in a playing field, um, just sort of going out this door on the big green patches and the school was on the other side. And you'd look up and the planes were coming back from their night bomb runs and they would open their bays and put out the wounded, hoping that they could pull their rip cords in order to land mm. safely to the ground. Some of them did, some of them didn't. Now, if they could get the plane to where they could get it on the ground, they did that. But if they couldn't, they would, the pilot would then get out and the plane came to the land, to the wherever it landed in the cornfields around us. And one night, um, the bomb bay of a homecoming aeroplane fell. Our house was here, and it fell right where you guys were sitting. And it was still on fire. Yes, I read it. And and uh, and so for me. I, it's always made me a very, if you touch me from behind and I don't know you're there, <laughs> I'll jump out of my skin. <laughs> and if a loud noise goes off and when the, the fire alarm 
did some strange things a few years ago, I was ready to get underneath the bench. <laughs> you know, and, uh, and that's the, you know, I, I, I do know what these young men go through when they come back from war, uh, war zones. I do know what they go through because I go through it still today. I do not like fireworks. I do not like thunderstorms because these all bring back memories and you can't stop them. You think, you know, after a while, and you can't stop them. They're there. Well, I can understand that. When your first memories of growing up is bombs dropping out of the air, that would tend to make most people nervous. And I can understand that. Now, after the war, do you remember well when the war was over? Oh, very clearly. Tell us about that day. When that was victory in Europe. Day. Victory in Europe, because they still hadn't done yeah. Japan yet. Yeah. Well, victory in Europe, the kids had for a long time They'd been built, bringing in, dragging in, you know, limbs, anything that would burn. They had this huge, huge bonfire in the playing field that that, um, I've talked about. And on the top of that was an effigy of Hitler. Uh I mean, if ever a man was hated and... And we um, and we would sing ugly songs about him, and and but the one song song that I remember the most, and it is with me the clearest, is the song that we sung to do with the bombs. It said, "When bombs are falling, Jesus is near; He will protect you till the all clear." Amen. And that was the song that has stayed with me and will stay with me, I suppose, until the day I die. Because we knew that was one thing. And I was reared in the church, not a Baptist church. I knew all about, and I was reared mostly with the Old Testament, Don, and I've told you this before. I knew about Jesus. I was taught about Jesus. It wasn't till I came to the United States and went to the Southern Baptist Church with my husband that um, I knew about a personal Jesus. Yeah, yeah. And it was then that I came to know the Lord Jesus Christ. The, the young man was preaching and Jesus said to me, you go tonight or I won't bother you at all. And I went that night, and he, it was the carpet. He was preaching on hell. The carpet seemed to be behind him to glow. Mm. Yeah. Because you know it was the, it was so real. I didn't cry and shout and sing because I'm English. <laughs> you don't do things like that. <laughs> I quietly took Jesus into my heart and my life. And my, my, my promise at that time was to rear my children and to exhibit before my children what it was like to know and live for the Lord Jesus. I wish Amen. I could say that all my children have done wonderful things, but they're children. They were children. They're human beings, and they walked the own, their own paths and made their own choices. And, and I, you have six sons. And I have six sons. Six sons. I have six sons. And, um, you know, it... Uh, well, let me ask you a question about uh, the UK, Great Britain, England. Uh, at the time of the war, there were a lot of ch- churches, a lot of Christians. And, uh, of course, it, the culture was much different then than it is now. Absolutely. And had great leaders, great political leaders, Winston Churchill. Mm -hmm. And I know in the late 1800s at one time in the city of London, there were five internationally known pastors that preached in the city of London. I don't think I can name them all five, but Charles Spurgeon, R.W. Dale, Joseph Parker, G. Campbell Morgan, and there was another noted preacher 
that was preaching. So England had a great spiritual history. And, uh, of course, a lot of that was still very relevant in the 1930s and 1940s as well. Wasn't that fifth one, Finney? No, I don't no. think so. No, I don't, I don't remember the fifth preacher's name. name. But five great, great internationally known preachers were preaching in the city of London at the same time. Now, the culture is much different today in England as, of course, it is here as well. Yes, it is. It's a very loose culture. And, and of course, England changed after World War II in 1945, 1946. You know, in those later years, they instituted um, sort of an open-door po policy and began to allow people from the colonies that were under the British crown to come in. You know, my father was a jockey. I should interject that because I remember um, my f parents were very interested because there was a man from Arabia that um, was a man that had a great stable. I mean, won a lot of races. And he also had a harem. Mm. And when he, and you see, they also at that time they, they instituted national health and um, they, gave, they gave families money in order to have children. You, you were given so much money because, you see, England lost so many men in the British, in the World War II. Our country was completely um, annihilated as far as manpower. Yeah. We, we, there was just, it just wasn't there. And, uh, and so they encouraged couples to have children up to five. And they would pay you so much a week if you had a child um, up to five, after five. And believe it or not, that, that be, you know, that's another one of those government things where the dog comes back and bites you because it's been a, problem, a thing that's created a great problem in England, as well as the international medicine situation. You know, it, Engl in England, uh, socialized medicine, one of the doctors and I talked about it when I was working in Beckley, West Virginia, about the, the fact they were bringing, you know, they're trying to institute and still are in this country. It's the worst thing that could ever happen because they, they don't take care of you. And we're seeing that now. I forget, and uh, if there's anybody medical here, please forgive me, but I have to tell the truth. Yeah. It is not a good thing because doctors are told what they can and what they can't do, who they could treat and who they can't treat. And I had a friend who needed a, a open heart surgery, needed it desperately. They'd forgotten to tell him not to take his um, Coumadin. He went in for the surgery. They couldn't do the surgery. They sent him home. It was three years mm. from that time until the time he actually had the surgery. Yeah. So social welfare program, socialized medicine, you think hurt England? It, I, think it was the, I think it was the thing that has taken England down to where it is. Because you see, the, the people from the colonies that came as immigrants then into Great Britain, they sort of took England over. Because as in this country, people that are immigrants, they're willing to work. They're willing to do anything for money. And when you, so, when you socialize things and they can get free this and free that, they, I mean, they will fill one house with more people than... Carter Scott Liverpool, that's the only yeah. way I know to put it. <laughs> yeah. And that's what's happened, you know. I mean, for an instance, now when I went home um, the first time after many years in 2003, and I went to the fish and chip shop, and there were two Indian people back, back, back there behind the fryers and serving, and they were they were feeding, they were, they were the fish and chip people. I was just used to 
to Englishmen behind that counter saying, all right, lovey, what will you have today? <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. you see, they, they, they absolutely Good took England over, and that has become a major problem um, religiously, because you see, they brought with them their, their faith beliefs, and uh, they took over communities. Had their own communities rather than assimilating Ex into the rest of the society. Exactly. They had their own neighborhood. Yes. It's, I it's, fear that will happen to our country. And that's what's happening. I, I mean, uh, I could stand back and watch it happen. Yeah. Let's talk a little bit about uh, when we think about Great Britain today and where it is spiritually. Do you feel like the United States is following the same pattern that Great Britain followed? Yes, I, I say that emphatically. Because in England, when I was a little girl, churches were full. I mean, my brother and I, my, we went to Sunday school and church and my, mother's, my mother didn't go and um, she always stayed at home. But we went to Sunday school and church we were instructed to sit on the front bench so that the pastor could see us. So that if we misbehaved, he would tell, <laughs> tell her. But the thing that I remember the most about those, and I will tell you this, Brother Donna, I was kind of a, uh, uh, an adventurous person. And uh, we, my girlfriends and I would go over during the week and one of the church wardens would um, let us climb the belfry, up in the belfry. And, and we, we literally climbed the, wooden, the great big wooden, you know, struts that, and, the, and, and walk around and touch those bells. I mean, and, and it is up yeah, there. The, the thing was you never looked down. You just kept looking at the bells. <laughs> <laughs> but, but the churches were full. And as when the, in the church I went to, when the Sunday morning service was coming to an end, the back door would quietly open and there standing would be a man with a trumpet and he would, pray, he would play taps. For those soldiers that had given their lives since we'd met together. And I think I've shared this with many of you before. During the week, my, on Wednesday nights, my mother would take us to the Methodist chapel and they would have young people's pleasant evenings. And of course then it was married women and, and kids. And on the back, towards the back, there was this young man that would come because some of this, the military men would come from the local um, Air Force station where the Americans were, fly, were stationed and flew out of on bomb runs. And he would sit back there and that one song, God Holds the Key, and he would be in many nights in his flight uniform because when he left, he was going out on a bomb run. And you can't imagine the size of relief from those women when he would come and there he'd be sitting. Yeah. Never met him personally. I was just a little six or eight year old, seven, eight year old girl probably at that time but I'll never forget his face and I'll never forget that dark hair. And I always wondered if he got to come home completely because we never knew who he was. Yeah. But, but yes, England now, when I go home to England, I went to the church that Jim and I were married in and it was full of bats. Is that right? That's how uninhabited it is. They have one minister that travels, you know, to several different churches, and some of them, believe it or not, are women. 
I do not approve of women being behind the lectern. I'm sorry. <laughs> God gave us many things to do, but he did not allow us to be behind the lectern. That isn't our duty. That isn't yeah. our duty. The first time I ever sang, I was 12 years old. I sang, I sang the 23rd Psalm in an English church. You know, there are so many things that come back to you when, as you that of when I was growing up. I could talk to you till in the morning, and we're not going to do that. <laughs> now, you told about when you got saved and stuff, and your husband was saved, and uh, so that started your Christian life. <laughs> Well, I hate to interrupt you there. Jim, at the time, when I was saved, he, I thought he was saved. He told me he was. And when we were courting, he, we were walking up this country road right before we were married, and he said, you know, you will have to go to church with me. I said, do what? <laughs> he said, you will have to go to church with me because, see, his family were no. churchgoers. And I understood that he was saved, but he wasn't. I was saved first. Mm -hmm. He was saved many years later. And jumping ahead just a little bit, uh, as he moved around with the military, y'all joined local churches wherever you were. Absolutely. Yeah. Yes, I... You got involved the, in the and ministry. Always, that was... And same thing, you know, but it was very difficult for me when I came to, the, to this church. Forgive me, I'm not going to say anything nasty. <laughs> but um, for me, we would walk into a church and it was, it was kind of, okay, we are here. What can and what do you want us to do? We will probably be here for this number of years. And you were immediately, I've been the women's missionary um, person. Can't think of my names, my, my orders of position right now. But, um, and, and, and at one point went to this big meeting and someone said, what's an English woman doing being in charge of the missionaries? She said, and then I heard you speak and I knew why. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> because missions has always been my because I had a school te a teacher when I was a little girl in school, and it was during World War II, and she would read us and pass around the letters that came from her missionary sister who was um, serving in Africa at that time. And you see, all their letters were, went through, and they were looked at them all and marked out the things that we... And so we would pray for her, you know, in our classes. And, and so I became very interested in missionaries. I, I also had an acquaintance whose sister was a missionary in China during those years. Terrible time. So missions. And I was missionary in missions in most churches. I've taught all groups. I've taught men and women. I've been the speaker in ladies' um, mission uh, groups and uh, women's seminars. Uh, you name it, I've probably done it. Yeah. And the great modern missions movement began in uh, Great Britain. In Great Britain, with the likes certainly. Of William Carey in the 1830s yes. and many, many British missionaries to go around the world. Modern missions basically were born in, in Great, Great Britain. Britain. That's yes. Right. And of course, with all their colonies, that was ripe ground for sending out missionaries and mm -hmm. a lot of mission societies in, uh, in England. Let's talk about this and we'll bring it to a close. Uh, you finished your college education. In this, <laughs> well, you know, I went, to, I went to school and I became a practical nurse. And from that, I went on into ultrasound and I was one of the pioneers in office ultrasound when they first started using machines. And my, the doctors I um, worked for sent me all over the United States to different hospitals, different people that were noted in ultrasound to have me taught and trained until I 
gained my um, licensure or registry, you might call it, in all fields of, of ultrasound but one. And, um, and then, uh, what was the other question you asked me about? When you finished your college degree. Oh, when I went, and then <laughs> after we, Jim became ill and he was diagnosed, we came to North Carolina because I wanted to get him close to um, good medical care. And um, I knew several doctors, they wrote me letters, and my husband ended up at, at Salisbury where we were sent, because of you know the people I knew, we were sent on to Durham. And that's where my husband went and was treated. And they did an amazing job. For eight years, my husband went for eight years, and after that eight years, when he was in remission, um, Jim said to me, because I could not, and I have to tell you this the way it went, because I could not get involved in this church. Mm. <laughs> not mean meaning. No, it's not. <laughs> um, because I couldn't get involved in this church, my husband said to me one day, why don't you go back to school? You've always loved academics. And I, so what I did was I took a class at Surrey Community and the teacher over there said to me, I would like to see you at Salem College. And so she apparently talked to somebody and before I knew it, Jim and Whitney and I were sitting in front of Salem College and I was going in for an interview. And I went in and I saw a lady named Dean, Dean Patterson and we talked about my going back to school and I told her my background and, and you know, my education because I had taken innumerable classes, you don't even want to know, um, and had all these certificates. The only thing that carried was my English. And so I had to take all the other classes again. So it took me five years and I went back to Salem College and I said to this, this dear lady at the time, I said, I am not wealthy. I don't come from royal blood. There's no, I have no money. And she gently smiled and looked at me and said, I believe you're just the person we need here. And I, did, it was a shock to my system. So she finished Salem College and you graduated, you were how old? I was um, over six, I was almost 70. 70 years old, graduated from college, isn't that great? Yep. Now right. some of you are thinking you're way over the hill yep. and you're not, you can do it. And, and I did it all ladies, I, the only thing I didn't do was was the, and we had a lady in this church, bless her heart, who has since passed, that because of my going to college, she had never gotten her high school certificate. And she went back to school and got her GED. <laughs> and I was so proud of her. Yeah. And I supported her all the way. But yes, I went to, and I was, I was chosen to go to, to, um, to Oxford and I studied um, I studied uh, um, medieval history at Oxford for a summer and loved every, I, I loved every minute of it. The only thing, you know, before I went to Salem, you know, God answers, God moves in a mysterious way. I was at a Wycliffe dinner, Jim and I were, and this man, because um, inevitably, wherever I go, when people hear my English accent, People come and talk to me, and this one man came and spoke to me, and he said, um, "If there was something you really wanted to do, what would you, what would you do?" And I said, "I would really like to go to a liberal arts college." And he was kind of looked at me, and um, and he said, "Oh." So anyway, I didn't think anymore. We chatted some more, and it, and it went on. Well, it turned out that Salem was a liberal arts college, and as I've told people before, very liberal arts. I had been reared mostly in, in Christianity, and all these people were talking about 
this liberality and liberal arts, and I had no idea what it was. And so I thought, if I go to a liberal arts college, I'll know. You did. And I found out. Oh, yeah. And I spent a lot of time, many times, coming and talking to Jim, because I had to take a religion class. And my religion class, believe it or not, came out of a New Testament that does not speak of people as man and woman. They're, they're not even spoken of as he's and she's. They're, taught, they're spoken of mainly as it's. <laughs> yeah. Because it was a non-gender. That's, yeah, that's the curriculum of that all was, the that's schools. That yeah. was the curriculum. And someone said, did you burn that? And I said, no, I didn't. I kept it because I had to have proof that I really had, had to take a class. But the, the teacher and I had many discussions. And my final paper for that particular course was my rebuttal to them teaching that type of. Yeah. All right. In conclusion, let's just talk about this for a little bit. Our country needs a spiritual awakening, doesn't it? It needs... It needs a great spiritual awakening. Not revival, but a spiritual a awakening. A spiritual where large awakening. large numbers of people are saved. Yes. Because, you see, I think that we have a lot of people that are walking um, and in churches that are saying they're saved and they're not. Yeah. And I, need, I think we need a spiritual awakening. And, and, and for me... I, um, somebody asked me if I was preaching. No, I'm not preaching, and I'm not preaching now. Mm -hmm. I'm saying that, that we live in a satanic, steered society. Yeah. We live in a satanic, steered society. I, when I went to the altar when my husband was in Vietnam, and I, at that time, laid my children's on the altar... And a voice came to me, and don't tell me that Satan can't talk to you. A voice came to me and said, if you continue to serve the Lord as you're doing, I'll take all of your sons away from you. Mm -hmm. he he, they, they all walked a different path. They did not go to church. I, You know, silly me. I thought when I gave my heart and life to Jesus Christ, when I took the book, and that's what I reared my children by, I reared my children by the book, was that if you, if you punish them when punishment's needed, if they leave, they'll come back. And praise God, I'm seeing my children. They're men with families of their own now. They know where to go. They know what needs to be done. Yeah. I have a son right now that I am giving to him routinely Don's messages on disc uh -huh. because he heard one that Don was preaching and Don preached in such a manner that it was so clear and understanding to him that I'm now... And my son is so interested in the Old and the New Testament coming together. And Don has been preaching that. And so I take him the discs, and he is a tra tractor-trailer driver for Walmarts. Hmm. And he listens to those. And America right. needs a spiritual, a spiritual revival. Yes. A spiritual... Yes. Well, they need to go back to the roots. Yes. I agree totally. You know, because the, 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 the original people, the people that came here from England originally came to, in order to worship God the yeah. way they wanted to worship. It had nothing to do with, with lords, ladies, and all of this stuff that wanted the land. Yeah. It was people that wanted to worship God. Spiritual freedom. And spiritual freedom. Amen. That's what was the foundation of your nation, people. Yes. It, and it wasn't money and land and no. things. I'll tell you right now, homes and houses, as long as there's a... And Jim and I reared our children. You work for what you get. 
Education is important if you have the ability. Our colleges and universities are full of young people that come and they graduate and they can't even read. That's true. That's true. Now I know because I, that I've true. been associated with that and yep. it's absolutely ridiculous. Yes. And so we need to have, and it begins right here. Yes. It begins right here. Because it begins in the church and the home, doesn't it? That's right. And my children, I have been told, it doesn't matter where you go, what life you choose, when you come home to this house, the rules are the same. Yeah. Yeah. They'll always be the same. Yeah. That's good. That is that we love the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and I'll be honest with you, I am so... Um, into this spiritual awakening. When I go to the grocery store as I check out, I say to the young person that checks me out, well, bless your heart, and I hope you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior today. Amen. Amen. And I say to the young man that checks me out, do you know Jesus as your Lord and Savior? <laughs> and some of them kind of look at me, that's okay. And some people, I wouldn't do that. I'd be so embarrassed. Why? Yeah. <laughs> He's your Lord and your Savior wherever yes. we go. And that, for me, is the important thing. Yes. Am I a perfect person? No. I've carried a little rhyme for years that tells you that I am not a perfect person. And I have a prayer that I carry that was written for me by a friend that tells me that whatever comes into my life, no matter how tough, it's coming into my life because it's the, what the Lord wants for me. Because you see, from the time I gave him my heart, he took over my life to steer it and to gear it the way that he would have it to go. Amen. I believe that. Well, Barbara, we love you and appreciate you. Appreciate you sitting down to talk to us tonight, and I think that'll be a help to a lot of people. Not many people left that remembers the war years and what that was like, and uh, we appreciate you so much. Our fathers, we bow in your presence this morning.